Welcome to West Virginia Beer Roads, a podcast all about beer from a West Virginia perspective. I'm Aaron McCoy here with my podcast partner, Charles Bakway. So Aaron, today we have exotic ales and killer burgers in West Virginia's oldest brewery. Sounds pretty exciting. It does. And as a guest, we have the co-owner and co-founder of Morgantown Brewing Company. Uh, the current version anyway, and that is Cody Cheesebro. Cody, welcome to West Virginia Beer Roads. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, so uh, you, uh, you and Chris DeFazio are the co-owners, right? Uh, that's mm -hmm. the, still the two. It's just the two of you. And you guys split up the brewing duties still pretty evenly? Yeah, we have, we've added on two, uh, two full-time brewers now. So... The good thing is we've now ramped up our production a little bit and we've been able to take a, a small step back, but still, yeah, still we're carrying bags of grain up the stairs and we're there every single brew day. But yes, we have, we have some people that help now, but uh, we're still very, very involved in the brewing process in the day to day. Well, let's talk about the brewery business. Um, mm -hmm. Give us and our listeners a snapshot. Um, what are you in a couple of sentences? What is Morgantown Brewing? Morgantown Brewing is it's an old institution in Morgantown. It's the oldest operating brewery in the state. It's been open and functioning as a brew pub in some capacity since 1992. It's changed hands several times, but Chris and I took over in 2018. And okay. since then we've really been a, we tried to put our focus on doing very exotic and crazy beers and doing uh, really killer smash style burgers. Okay. Talk to me about your target market uh, demographics and um, whenever, whenever you're um, advertising, who are you shooting towards? Oh yeah. So this is, we get, we get asked this all the time and a lot of people sort of assume that since we're in the university city of the state that we, that college kids would really be our, our bread and butter, but it turns out they kind of have their own an ecosystem, all theirs. Most of them aren't legally able to drink anyway. And the ones that are typically don't have money to do so. Right. So <laughs> our target market is really the, it's the ecosystem that surrounds the university. It's the business leaders that come in to do conferences in town. It's uh, academics. It's people that work in the pharmaceutical industry uh, who are still in town from Milan. And it's a lot of people that work in the petrochemical industry as well, because that's also still huge in Montague County. So it's a lot of the sort of young urban professionals in our uh, little little nook of the woods of West Virginia. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about your actual physical plant and brewing setup, your equipment. How big is your brew house now and uh, your fermentation space? How much do you have? So we have, we still brew on our original copper top direct fire 10 barrel brew house from 1992. It still has the original copper seals with the American manufacturing from uh, Ohio in it. And now I, have to, the, I, I have to break in just a second. You weren't here in 1992 when that was purchased, were you? I, I turned 30 this year. So I, uh, I was born in 1990. So I was, oh. I was very small, but I, I was alive. I do, I do have very faint childhood memories of driving past those tanks and wondering what was going on in there, but who would have known that later on? So yeah, we, we still brew on the original copper brew house. Uh, our fermentation space is, let's see, we have 60, 120, we have 130 barrels worth of fermentation space. It's a mix between old tanks uh, that are original from 1992. There are a few bigger ones that were brought in around 10 years ago. And then all of our bright tanks down in the basement are original from 1992. So probably about 80% of all of our brewing equipment is is original to the, to the brewery yeah. and still operating. So if you were operating at high efficiency, what do you, what would you guess how many total barrels of beer could you produce in a in a 12 month period if we were really really cranking them out and we were yeah. really doing i mean we were in there all day every day and, and really moving them we could do about 2000 barrels in a year wow. and that's our that's if we're really turning every single tank all the time even in the peak of the brew pubs days they've never done quite that much at the peak of all of the distribution i think the barrel was around 1500 since we stopped doing all distribution and we sell everything just in house now, our barrelage is is further down, but the company is is operating much better. Which is yeah, uh, you guys, uh, you two, Chris and you have been uh, head of this again since two thousand eighteen or two thousand eighteen. Yes, that's it. So it's only been uh, two years or so uh, that that you've been able to, uh, you know, 
work at, but you've made some improvements. I know because nowadays I see can beer at Morgantown Brewing. Talk a little bit about oh. your packaging. Yes, so we, we have just a small October seamer, so all of those cans are handmade by <laughs> wow. our, our tireless staff who are canning all day long, usually while they're doing another job as well. Uh, but luckily, we placed a down payment on a Wild Goose canner. It's the same one. We did a trip down to Short Story to can with them for a day and see how it works. And uh, we're super excited for this because it's gonna, we're going to be able to make literally probably 10 times to 20 times as many cans in a given shift. So what do they, what do they tell you a short story that they can produce how many cases of cans in a day or whatever hour? I, I remember when we were there, we, we were there canning and once everything was set up and running, it was a few a handful hours. I think it was, I don't know, two, three hours of canning and we did almost 700 cans in that amount of time. So wow, yeah. that was great. I think that <laughs> yeah. if, if you have it running full speed, it can do up to a thousand an hour, but it's, That'll be a, adjustments. That will be a game changer for you from yes. that hand seamer. I know you, you, it's hard work now just to keep that one little cold box door full uh, yes. or half full. <laughs> yeah, we're hoping that the idea is uh, we did away with all distribution of kegs because the logistics are, it's tough to keep track yeah. of all of the kegs and where they are. And it's, it's not only logistically difficult, it's also financially difficult to maintain that. So, um, we're hoping that once the canning line comes and we actually got a call today that said January 7th, it'll be here. So once that happens, we're hoping to hit the ground running with retail again, because it's, it's much easier to ship cans out into the world that then just go into recycle bins as it is to kegs, which go into coolers that you have to then track down and find. Yeah. So th th brewery. yeah. Cody, that wasn't on my list of questions, but I know in the past you had stopped doing any kind of distribution you, you can briefly address that, maybe get us up to date on where you stand since you brought it up. Yeah, absolutely. So this is another question we get all the time and people think that we're sort of crazy when we, we took over the brewery in 2018. And at that time, there were thousands of kegs a year going out to various distributors around the state. And according to state code, uh, a brewery can't discriminate against distributors. So we have to sell all the same kegs at all the same prices, the same availabilities of all of the beers to every distributor. So our options were either keep this whole big operation going or shut the whole thing down. It turned out that it was costing more money than it was actually making. So we shut the whole thing down. Um, you fast forward to, to today and our big leg legislative goal for this year, along with the whole rest of the Brewers Guild, is we are trying to amend the, the code so that distributor contracts have a, a term limit of something like two years. So basically a distributor and a brewer, they agree they like each other. The distributor is going to sell the beer for the brewer. If everything works, then you renew the contract two years later. If things aren't working out, then you can go your separate ways. Right now they're contracts for life. And so we're bound to all of those contracts. And so it's either we have to start this whole distribution network back up or just keep it all at zero. And as of yet, we haven't been able to do the former. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that would make a big difference. <laughs> but you're basically yeah. hoping that if the legislation passes, then you may rekindle some distribution relationships. Is that what I'm getting? Well, if the legislation passes, then it means we'll be able to do our own distribution, which ah. is, which is, it's more powerful from a business standpoint because right. you're able to capture the full margin on the sale so long as you're able to make the delivery without making it cost too much, which locally we know that we'd be able to do very, very well. And that's the, that's our first goal is to try to pick a handful of really good local accounts that are going to uh, carry our cans on the shelves and possibly carry our kegs as a tap. Great. But right now from a legal standpoint, we aren't able to do that. Well, tell me about your tap room and your restaurant um, size and space. In other words, give me a visual picture of the percentage of indoor versus outdoor space that you currently have. Mm -hmm. So the, the building is, it's one of the oldest buildings in Morgantown. I think the foundation of it was laid in 1840, something like that. And then, so it's pre-Civil War. And then the building was finished being constructed around the turn of the century. Uh, so it's a very, very old historic building in Morgantown. The big open dining room is the original location of the Gabriel Brothers, like their flagship store where Gibby Gabriel, you know, stocked the shelves with 
with uh, socks and pants and whatever else, I, I guess. Um, before that, it was a coal mine supply store, but now uh, in, the, in the 90s, it was converted into a brewery. We have about, with the COVID guidelines, uh, 60 or 70 seats inside with all of our tables spaced out and all the booths have big uh, plastic partitions between them. And that's your 50% capacity, right? That's about 50% capacity of inside, okay. yeah. Okay. And then our, our brew house is actually, it's a separate building that has then been melded into the original building with big archway walls. So it's a lot of original exposed brick. And then there's a deck, which seats about, I think another 40 to 50 people outside, which again is 50% capacity because of state guidelines. Okay. Now, a lot of our craft beer fans and brewery, small brewery fans around the state are very interested in the kind of the financial health of our small breweries this year since ever, you know, you heard a lot of stories about business being down and kind of curious as to you guys, how has your business trended this year versus a year ago, 12 months ago? I mean, where, how are you running? What percent? Oh yeah. Well, just like, I think pretty much any restaurant that's in Morgantown, we rely pretty heavily on the tourism crowd of people generally coming and going in and out of the city. It's a very cosmopolitan metro area in West Virginia, so it drives a huge part of our business. With that being said, our sales from 2019 to 2020 are down, I think it's something like 40 to 50% for the year over. And it's been a combination of the, the varying degrees of, of lockdown and slowly opening back up in the spring, which was we opened a little bit slower than many of the other restaurants did. And we opened with slightly more strict guidelines than a lot of the other restaurants did. And we said very early on that we want to make sure that we're one of the restaurants in town as things started to splinter and people kind of got their own COVID affected everybody differently. And I think some restaurants wanted to be a little more wild west and let things go. Some wanted to be a little more strict. We definitely wanted to be one of the restaurants that took the guidelines seriously. And we said, we're gonna be the a restaurant for the people who care the most and not the people who care the least. So while it helped a lot from keeping confidence uh, among our market, it did hurt financially, but it's okay because they're financial losses that we're going to make up in the year coming now that good news is starting to come out. And we think that eventually not too distant future, a day will come when COVID might not be affecting the world quite in the way that it is right now, but no, no, it sounds like you don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like you have, you have a positive attitude. So uh, that's good to hear that. Sure. Uh, yeah. um, talk to me about what, what brands and styles are selling best for Morgantown Brewing Company. Yeah. So the, before COVID, we always talked about how at Morgantown Brewing, we definitely sell an experience. Unfortunately, when everything is in lockdown and no one's allowed to travel, we don't really sell quite as much of an experience. We definitely sell burgers and beers now, but nonetheless, it's, it's a taste of normalcy. So what we've noticed is a lot of our flagship beers like the Alpha Blonde, the Golden Boy Kolsch, the Dark Internet Porter, things that are kind of easily replaced at retail and you can get something that tastes pretty similar to it at Kroger for a lot cheaper, those brands are hurting. But what we've expanded on and what we've done uh, a lot of new recipes with and what most of the barrelage of our sales is being constituted as is the crazy stuff. It's like the dessert beers, the sherbet beers, to some degree, hazy IPAs, and definitely the sours. The sours have been the biggest, fastest selling. And if you want to look at barrelage, I think in the year 2019, carry out beer, uh, growlers and cans, this was maybe 15% of all the volume that we sold. This year, it's looking like it's going to be 50, five, five zero to 60% of all of our beer that goes into tanks is then packaged as beer that's to go. And the other half is actually consumed on site. That's so, pretty amazing. Yeah. Big jump. Yeah. It was closer to like 90% when we first opened up. But. Well, I know um, you touched a little bit on the different series that you're doing. Can you distinguish a little bit between the milk, uh, sugar, lactose versus the Berliner Weiss or kettle sour? What's talk to me a little bit about that, the differences in what you're releasing. Yeah, so the we have sort of a strange and crazy way of making sours that a lot of breweries are, are doing uh, kettle souring where you put you inoculate bacteria into the kettle and then use you ferment it later. At the brewery, our our original copper brew house is an old style German brew house. So the fastest way to make the most amount of beer is to dilute. So what we do is we brew super, super strong wort. We dilute it 
we ferment it with either uh, just a plain yeast to ferment it very dry, or we ferment it with a blend of uh, either sort of like new age souring yeasts, or sometimes we'll do a bacterial culture in the fermenter if we're, if we're really feeling froggy and we feel like we have a stringent week of cleaning ahead of us, then we'll, we'll go for it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we have certain kegs that we only use for sours because you'll come to find that as you have sours in kegs then everything that goes in that keg afterward becomes a sour but some of the sours we add milk sugar to just like some of the IPAs we add milk sugar to. Milk sugar is it's dietarily restrictive for some people so we try right. not to keep too much of it on at a time but it really does add a nice like a, it, it makes the foam have it's a different kind of sugar that's in it so it's it's a sugar that adds a lot of body without necessarily tasting super sweet right. and in my humble opinion without necessarily tasting milky either it, it it blends with the hops and it blends with the sugars that are already present in the malt and it gives it sort of a candy-like flavor and brings everything together to make it taste a little more fruity i guess i'm curious there uh, among those different styles are they all equally popular? I mean, how are they trending? The fruit combination, as we've come to find it, when it comes to fruited beers, that's really what makes the difference. And uh, people that are lactose intolerant, generally they'll be okay if they drink a beer with <laughs> lactose in it. I mean- Go ahead and try it. <laughs> there's, there's, there's varying degrees of lactose intolerance. I'm, don't, make, don't take this I'm, as me saying I'm to people kidding. that have dietary. No, no. <laughs> But I'm, I'm lactose intolerant, which is ironic because my name is Cheesebro. I generally don't have a huge problem with them. It's, it's, a, it's a trace amount of milk sugar. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to say that you should just be drinking things that you're allergic to. But at the end of the day, no, people don't generally have a preference if they don't have that dietary restriction. They mostly look for the fruit combination. There's certain fruits that just when you put it in a beer, it's going to sell a lot better. People love raspberries and people love passion fruit. Mm -hmm. and so what, do you, what do you, you, you can pretty much guarantee if you put out a sour with raspberries or passion fruits that it's going to fly off the, off the tap. Ah, uh, yes, this is me unlocking the secrets of <laughs> brewery marketing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of an inside joke among the, the, the yeah. brewing crew with us that we always have a barrel of either raspberries or passion fruit on hand because you never know. <laughs> Well, talk to me. Um, so we, you mentioned what's really selling well, and, and you sort of touched earlier on some of your um, flagship beers that maybe aren't selling as well. Is, is that what I got from you earlier? Is that if you had to say what is, you know, I guess. Like traditional styles are the ones that are what's, slow. What's suffering as far as what you're putting out there for sales? Yeah, the, it's definitely, it's the normal pub beers. It, it's our Kolsch, the Blonde Ale. And I, I think that a big reason for this is the pub beers are really popular among the traveling crowd because they're, you know, you're stopping in town for the weekend and you're going to stop in at the brewery. You might get something crazy, but a lot of times you want a beer that's just going to go well with a burger for your dinner for that night. When you get repeat local business, it's typically because we're releasing a new beer once a week and we always have something that's brand new coming out. So it's a lot of our the crazy over the top beers that we're selling, that's where we're seeing the most repeat business, especially with beers that are to go. So it's, it's definitely, we used to keep, you know, two, three, four taps open for really crazy stuff. And now it's like five, six, seven taps of really crazy stuff because it's, it's generally just doing better because it's bringing a lot of the same faces in over and over as people are traveling less and staying home more. Aaron, did he tell us about hazy IPAs, which seems to be the I rage do. still yeah, yeah. in America? And all, one of my favorite styles. Oh, yeah. I, I, love, I love the hazy IPAs. Same. We have, uh, it took us a little while to get dialed in exactly how we wanted to be making these because it's, the haziness is, it's a cosmetic quality. It does affect the flavor a little, but you'll come to find that if you brew a beer intending to call it a hazy, oftentimes the yeast will go awry and you might not wind up with exactly what you intended. But if you brew a beer that you might want to be crystal clear, then who knows, it might wind up as a hazy. With all that being said, there are quite a few things that you can do that will really make a beer turn out just phenomenally. That you can, that you can call a hazy IPA. The yeast selection is super important. Our house yeast strain for our hazy IPAs is, it's just a White Labs British yeast that's a pretty generic uh, yeast strain that a lot of breweries use for all kinds of different styles. We've come to find that on our particular system with the way that we happen to brew, it just makes really nice, smooth tasting, sweet, 
IPAs that don't have a ton of bitterness to them. The other really, the most important thing maybe is the, uh, the timing of the hop additions. We were always yeah. kind of blown away by exactly how much poundage of hops you have to add to every batch, but we've been upping and upping and upping and upping the hopping for pretty much continuously for the whole two years we've been brewing. And there is a point where it's too much, but we've found that we've, we've really nailed the sweet spot with something like 30 to 40 pounds of hops per 10 barrels of beer, which is pretty on trend with what a lot of other big city breweries are hopping. And I guess I'm uh, curious, how well do those sell in the kind of the flow of, uh, of beer at Morgantown Brewing? So we've, we've noticed that IPAs are more of a on-site beer. People like to come for a burger and drink an IPA. People like to take home the crazy stuff. Yeah. Because it's, it's a lot of times it's going to can trades. We've, we've had a lot of uh, canning proxies that come in and you know, they've got their five empty egg crates and they want 500 cans of whatever it's not like, sorry, you can clean us out, but we're still going to be canning all afternoon. I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, so we've, we've made it in with the, with that crowd. And I hope that once our big canning line comes in, that we're able to start slinging cases because I think that'll help business. Yeah. Well, we're entering, entering the holiday season uh, soon. And just curious, do you guys have anything kind of stocked up, whether it be uh, beer or food specials and things for the holidays. Oh yeah, we've got all kinds of fun stuff. So we learned that people love holiday beers in a big way. The Holiday Blonde is one of the, it's one of the most popular beers that we brew all year. And it's, it's, it's a great, it's, it's from a business standpoint, it's an excellent beer to brew because it's one that we know that once it comes out of the tank, it's definitely, definitely going to get sold and it's not going to sit in the basement. So we will be selling the Holiday Blonde again this year, and that'll be out in just a few weeks. I think we're, we're brewing that one early next week, and then it'll be super fresh beginning of December. Uh, we have the Just Got Put on Tap yesterday, and we're going to be announcing it today. So I don't know when this comes out, but very soon. A few, yeah, it'll be a few more days on us. but Okay, well, yeah, so it's uh, coming out. It came out on Tuesday is our Ding Dong Imperial Pastry Stout, which is loaded with hundreds and hundreds of those hostess <laughs> Ding dong cakes that look a little bit like uh, oh, they're kind yeah. of like chocolate covered creamy hockey puck little things. Yeah. So yeah, we have a an eleven point something percent oh. alcohol. <laughs> Mr. Goofy Ding Dongs is the name of the beer. Mr. Goofy Ding Dongs. Okay. <laughs> so that'll be out in cans. Uh, I think the cans will be here next week, maybe week after. Oh, yeah, that ought to flip that. the breweries turn styles and get some people <laughs> in off the street. Oh, definitely. Hopefully, and then we also also have a holiday sour coming out and it doesn't have a fun name yet but it's going to have orange cranberry vanilla and cinnamon which oh, I'm really that excited. sounds delicious right. yeah mm -hmm. um tell me what you think your outlook is going to be at business wise for the winter how do you think you're going to survive or are you concerned about it yeah unfortunately we just found out today that our, our canning line was supposed to come next week but it got pushed back to January. And you know, I can't really blame the Wild Goose Company. I imagine that there was some kind of a holdup somewhere in manufacturing because of COVID with the whole world sort of being a big traffic jam right now. But um, for the winter, we're gonna keep just very, very limited outdoor dining open. Um, we were part of the working with our local delegates and eventually with the governor very early in the pandemic to get delivery legalized. Right. Delivery is a lot to handle logistically. If it's, if it's one of the only things you're doing, you can do it really, really well. If it's not one of the only things you're doing, it's kind of tough to pull off. So we're thinking that maybe if, if COVID happens to take a turn for the worst and before the vaccine's able to be rolled out, the cases go higher than they are right now and things get shut down, whether by our own choice or by state mandate, we'll probably go back to delivery because it, it worked well for the short time that we did it. And Hopefully it'll work better because now it's not also we're delivering and also we have a brand new menu and also here's our new, <laughs> it's right. sort of tough to get people to do brand new things. When you, you know, when the world all moved to delivery, it seemed like Domino's Pizza did really, really, really well and everybody else had to kind of pick up the pieces, but. Well, I can see that helping you survive winter. Um, so that would be, I guess, your plans then for enhancing business during the cold months. Um, yeah, and we're also, we're looking into putting heaters outside, but. That was gonna be my next question. <laughs> Yes, I don't know if you've heard this, but there's also going to be a massive shortage of heaters this oh, year. Oh, I'm because, sure. So. There's no doubt. Yes. Yeah. Of so course. Go ahead and add it to the list. But, but, but you uh, weren't. We're able you to get our hands on some. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, I think it's time to taste a few, or at least a couple of Morgantown Brewing Company beers right now. And we've got a couple here. Aaron's going to pull one out. I think we're going to start with, uh, mentioned the Hazy IPA. And yeah, yeah. I picked one up the other day. And I, I want you to lead us through this. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, Force Lightning, it, the IPAs, they, we've come that we brew them in very small batches. So they sell very quickly and generally they're very fresh. Uh, so those just get a generic label slapped on them. This one's Force Lightning. It's named after uh, Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars. <laughs> and uh, it's a, uh, what is it, Sabro and Simcoe that went into that one, which it gives it a very- That's what I saw on the list, yes. Yeah, it gives it, it, gives it a very, very coconutty flavor. Uh, Sabro is definitely a, a very new age hop and it has a, it's sort of a whiskey like component that has kind of a kind of a wood quality, but the main flavor that really, really comes through is coconut. Mm -hmm. If you'll notice, it's also a little bit darker too. It's got a Munich 10 uh, yeah, malt in it. Mm -hmm. Definitely darker than a lot of those uh, current hazies. Yeah, a lot of the current hazies are brewed with like nothing but Pilsner malt and right, King Arthur bread. Exactly. Flour. Yeah. I like adding just a little bit of like a something of a caramelized malt it's not gonna block a ton of the aroma I like, like it would in yeah, yeah i like right. the i like that color yeah it's, it's, it's not gonna i was gonna say it's a, a little tiny bit piney i think it's the pininess comes from the simcoe the simcoe ah. is it's definitely a darling of the brewing industry because it has sort of a resinous oh yeah piney like almost a cannabis flavor. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorites to blend, which is, mm -hmm. it goes so well with anything that has more of an earthy quality to it. And that's uh, something that we see in, in most of our breweries who are doing a lot of hazy IPAs, or probably any IPA, they're, they're, they're getting that menu of hops out and we're getting a lot mm -hmm. of exotic hops. This um, Sabro, uh, I mean, I don't know, tell me, is it like a Pacific hop? Is it a West Coast hop? The ones we get come from the Yakima Valley. So we're still, mm -hmm. we joke that we're still small potatoes. We're not one of those big guys that has like <laughs> massive hop contracts with a big freezer full of whatever you might be able to find. We do all of our hop purchasing on the spot market. So I just, I keep an email list close by and anytime I get an email that says new hops have been added, we just jump on and generally if the name is a bunch of numbers and letters and it says experimental, send me a bag, we'll try it out. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll have our, that batch. And generally they're always good too. The experimental hops are, that you don't really get any that are, that yeah, are not no dogs. the second time. That's cool. Uh, are there other varieties that you've found that you kind of have par are partial to with some of those newer ones that maybe a lot of people haven't heard of, but if they come to Morgantown Brewing Company, they might get some. The Sabro is one of my, my very, very favorite of the new age hops, which is similar to HBC. Oh, that's okay. Uh, don't get, don't get too technical. <laughs> I think it's what? 472, which are also very, very coconutty. And very uh, coconutty. 536 might be. I need to Google these numbers to make sure. Uh, but. <laughs> maybe you better use names Just, that yeah. people can see on a list when they see a beer bait. Uh, that's okay. A lot of times we just list experimental hops because they're they're the newer ones that mm. don't have a cool name yet, like Warrior or yeah. Magnum or something. That's true. I didn't know if there, you know, like so many people have used the, um, uh, well, like Citra, Motueka, whatever. Uh, what are some of those typical blends that people put in the in the popular mm -hmm. hazy? Azaka, Mosaic. Yeah, and they're all very good. I don't know that yeah. there, there are a ton of difference in them depending on maybe how the brewer handles the hop additions. That'll make a difference. We've come to find that if we're doing, we usually do 10 barrel batches of blonde. We'll do 40 total pounds of hops, 10 in the Whirlpool, 30 in the tank, and it's going to be yeah. bueno, bueno, bueno IPA every single time. It's, <laughs> It's you lose a ton of beer because dry hopping the hops just swell in the tank and you lose, you know, three four barrels of, of actual servable beer. But right. That's six barrels that you're left with. Oh my goodness, it's so good. So good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know uh, you, uh, you learned years ago. Well, years, you know, three or four years ago, that if it said Citra Mosaic, you know, combination, I was probably going to like it Same. unless the brewer yeah. just was a, you know, wasn't any good. But I mean, typically you you find. Ah, that's a good combination. It, so I imagine there are other hop combinations that have worked for brewers around the country. And um, you've picked a couple, I guess, that's worked for you. 
the combinations like this, Simcoe and S S Sabra. Simcoe and Some people say Sabra, Sabro. I... Sabro, yeah. Sabra, I, I did. Uh, you correct it, us. <laughs> Citra is is another darling of the industry. It's it, right. pretty much anything that you blend with Citra is always going to taste good. If you blend yeah, it with good. Cascades, it's going to taste classic, but a little piney. If you blend it with something new age, it's going to be really tropical and fruity. It has a way of bringing out the other flavors of other hops. El Dorado so, is one of my other favorite because oh, right. it's it's candy like. It's very it gives it sort of like a peachy candy kind of flavor. Yeah. And do you are you do you subscribe to the school that says that it, it, if you add the right hops or the right fruit addition, then it'll help your untapped ratings. Uh, <laughs> well, that's what I hear. People think that. Certain one, certain styles, I mean, will get, or certain fruits get a, a lot higher rating every day, every time. Yeah. Untapped is, it's, it's the wild west. It's such a, yeah. it's such an uphill battle all the time. But from what I have come to find, there are certain fruit combinations that really, really work. And self-admittedly, there are some that just don't. And we've come to find that with sours, if you want to get a really killer rating on a sour, pick one very, very tart fruit and one very sweet fruit. So like a sweet fruit, like a mango goes really, really well with a tart fruit, like passion fruit. Ah. If you do something that's a little more sweet, like a raspberry, then add like a cranberry or something that's going to bring a tartness to it. The ones that we've that. personally had a lot of success with have been, have been blends like that. One, one tart and one sweet. Oh, that makes Listen sense. to Missy Elliott was our highest rated oh, and that yeah. was raspberries and lime. So the lime is very, very tart. Uh, and the raspberries are a bit tart, but not, you know, killer. Yeah, as we get into this next uh, beer, we're going to try, and you can introduce it, Cody, oh, yeah. so we get the correct name because I couldn't quite tell. Uh, so this sure. is the most polarizing beer in America. <laughs> this is Honeydew <laughs> Sherbert buckets. So this beer is is literally just it's a it's a heavy blonde ale that we brewed and fermented very dry, and then we adjuncted into the beer a whole bunch of honeydew sherbet. So it is, it is a 100% dessert beer through and so through. So this is, is, has real sherbet, honeydew sherbet in the beer. Not, it actually not, has, yes, it has just, such a high concentration of honeydew sherbet in the beer that if you were to put that into a slushy <laughs> machine, it would actually turn it into a sherbet. So this beer is for people that can afford their insulin. This is a beer for people who <laughs> love sugar. If you like sweetness, it's a great it's a great dessert finisher. So it it has a bit of a tartness to no. it just from being fermented dry, um, but most of the flavor is going to come from <sighs> honeydew honeydew sherbet. Yes, yeah, it, it also has fantastic. chlorella in it. Yeah, it we also, were gonna yeah, yeah, talk about that. that. What yeah. the heck is that? Please, chlorella is a kelp superfood, which uh, it has a, f a flavor similar to matcha. The intent was that it was going to turn the beer green. Turns out it doesn't actually turn beer green. It all sinks to the bottom, but it does add tons of antioxidants. So <laughs> you can take that home with you. So I think this, it works better as a food coloring when you put it in like dough or something that holds it. Yeah, I don't think the color came through. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> no. Hey, uh, Cody, uh, this says unpasteurized, unfiltered. You know, I think all your beers are like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one doesn't have the actual milk sugar lactose added it just it has real ice cream or whatever you want to call it yes so that one it didn't actually get adjuncted with lactose by us right but there is lactose in sherbet so that it, it still does have dairy in it so it well, has like sure, that sure. sort of creamy quality but yeah and and are there any hops in it no there are no no hops whatsoever I, went, I wasn't tasting here. any but i wonder yeah <laughs> I found it a lot of people taste it. They say, this is good. This is not beer, but, but this is good. <laughs> and I'll take it. Pretty interesting for this style. The ABV is 7.7%, uh, which is higher than I guess I would expect it to be. We've come and, to notice that the, the gimmick crowd, they come to have fun. <laughs> so, and what's the, the purpose of the name Buckets that's on the back of this? beer name buckets we were all trying to think of of uh what like what comes to mind when you think of honeydew and i was like okay i don't have any associations with honeydew but i do know like close your eyes do you remember your fourth birthday party <laughs> a big rainbow the, the bucket of it, 
I've never seen Sherbert come in anything but a big ridiculous plastic bucket. So I was like, yes. we've got to just call it buckets with a Z because then it, it kind of plays off of, of uh, nailing a, a totally perfect three-pointer from, from the half-court line in basketball and just screaming buckets as soon as it goes through the hoop. <laughs> It's a it's a word that we've brought back several times in in a few of our recipes. Yeah, well, it's it is drinkable. I mean, oh, it's absolutely. not a bad beverage. Like I say, is it a beer? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's sweet. There's tons of it's melon a, in it. Yeah, it's <laughs> sweet. But I, but America has a sweet palate. Uh, you know, I, I far sweeter than I ever would have assumed. It's it's been kind of fun testing and dipping your toes in the market because some things that that I take a sip of and I'm like, this is horrifically cloying it just explodes on untapped and people love it and the sales are through the roof and i i can't explain it sometimes when i think things are too bitter people wind up loving it too so i've learned that you never never base what the market is going to think off of what you might assume taking right. the first sip of a beer that you've made it's it's like stand-up comedy you never know if your own joke is funny <laughs> or not you know well you know we um when i when i bought a couple of beers up there i also bought a can of the Mountain Boy because it was fun to find that. And talk a little bit about your uh, pale ale and how you, it's your philosophy on, on brewing a pale ale. And is, is that your recipe or is that uh, Chris's? Uh, that was a, Chris and I actually worked together on that one because the, the goal of that beer and with our flagship series in general was we wanted to make sure that with all of the changes that we were bringing to the brew pub and it, it can be kind of disruptive to the market and people are finicky and if, if, mm -hmm you change something that they used to like, then you might not hear from that person again. So we knew that we wanted to keep a flagship line of beers that were just three or four beers that we always have all year round that are super reliable. They're analogs of other great styles that are out there and they're alternatives to them. And it would help so that when brand new faces come into the pub for the first time, they're not looking down a menu of all honeydew, sherbet or ding dong, imperial style. You know, there's gotta be something in there that, that goes good with a burger. I personally just love drinking session beers. But when I'm when I am drinking, I, I like drinking something that's a little bit more palatable. I guess in my younger years, I liked the big, heavy, crazy, obnoxious, high gravity beers, and now it's fun because I've learned how to make those, so I can keep them in the market without <laughs> having to drink them all the time myself. But the Mountain Boy specifically, we wanted to make just a classic American East Coast pale ale with some caramel malts. Um, a little bit of Vienna malt to give it kind of a bready backbone. And then we hop it with only citra. And that's it. It's just a, it's just a very simple, classic American pale ale. And the idea is we want to have something that somebody comes in, they're familiar with craft beer, but maybe they're not super, super well versed and nuanced in all of it. It tastes a little bit like a Sierra Nevada. That's the best way that I could describe it. In my opinion, it's better. It's a little more tropical, more fruity, a little yeah. bit more bitter maybe. But overall, you're not going to shock any palates by cracking that can open. Right. And that's, Plus, it's that, got really cute label art. <laughs> and it's important. And, I, and that's something we were going to throw up some pictures of some of these cans. I want you to talk a little bit about your designer who does a lot of your, your labels and talk a little bit about that relationship, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, we, when we started canning, we did everything just in generic labels that were black and white and extremely clinical and, and just hideous. And for a little while we kind of debated like, okay, are we gonna try to like, th do we know anybody? Like, do you wanna make the cans? Do I, I, like, I'm not a graphic designer. I wanted somebody that was actually going to bring a life and a personality and a, a brand to these cans. And I'm so happy that we had Liz Pavlovic design them. So she, she runs a, a design company called Liz Pavlovic Design. She has her own sort of like cartoonish merchandising brand called uh, Keep On Creepin' On, which is all based around West Virginia paraphernalia, like pepperoni rolls and ramps and the Mothman and the Flatwoods Monster. Her artwork is totally worth checking out. I'm, I'm always very humbled because her, her social media presence is bigger than the brew pubs. So when she posts that she designed our cans, there's typically more of a response than when we post that we have a new beer out, which is you know that you're working with a good graphic artist when they have a following that's, that's that big. And um, I think she's done a really great job of, of giving a, a sort of fun loving, uh, cheeky personality to the, to the brand that's very cartoonish, but also it's kind of sexy in a fun way too. It, it's yeah. so, it's just silly and whimsical and, and over the top and, and 
I really like it. I don't. I couldn't have been more pleased with. Yeah. So so she did the dogs like on the Golden Boy and Mountain Boy yes. or whatever the. Yeah. yeah, she she so put the like, mountain boy uh, with with um, the golden retriever climbing the mountain, <laughs> and the the alpha blonde is all the different dogs watching the, the the main the main dog with her long flowing blonde hair, and then all the <laughs> listen to series as well has been these really really beautifully angled hand drawn pictures of the fruit just like splashing <laughs> citrus juice all over the front of the can. It's there. I, I think that. I really like them and the markets really responded well to them. And I, I think that the, a lot of the, the exposure that we've gotten from people sharing our posts and from people recognizing our cans out in the world could largely be attributed to, to the artwork that's gone on them. That's good. Say your name one more time, Liz. Her name's Liz Pavlovic. Pavlovic, Liz yes. Pavlovic. Yes. It, it, and it's good and that- Keep on uh, Creeping On is her brand. Now, thank you for using a, a local artist and a West Virginia artist to, for your can mm -hmm. art. I think that's wonderful. We're seeing a lot of brewers around the state do that. And it's really helping create a little art market out there sure. and a business for some of our creative people in the state beyond brewers. It's love, love that uh, collaboration. And talk to me about a big imperial stout and any of that going to be brewed. You must make one in the winter at, somewhere. At some point. Oh yeah, so we we do generally when we make our imperial stouts, we we always do them with adjuncts. So we have a couple of different base recipes that we use. The the one that we use the most often is uh, it, it was actually the liquid of fundido, the the base stout. We have that one, and then we have another one that we've jokingly, affinitively called uh, scud missile because it's a it's a more <laughs> Russian style imperial stout. So that's the one that we brewed this most recent time for Mr. Goofy Ding Dongs. So. Um, our imperial stouts, we always shoot for at least 11% or above. Sure. The first one we did, Liquido Fundido, was um, habanero peppers, cinnamon, cacao nibs, and vanilla, like a, like a Mexican hot chocolate. We did one with raspberries and cacao nibs, which was like a dessert style that was more for like the Valentine's Day crowd. Um, we did one in Buffalo Trace barrels that we aged for an entire year that wound up being wow. like much, much more alcoholic than it was when we put in. So thank goodness we passed the 15% uh, uh, ABV <laughs> before we released that beer because we, we pushed it pretty close. And the most recent one we've done is Mr. Goofy Ding Dongs, which is... That name cracks me up. <laughs> so that, I yeah, I, well, I was thinking, I mean, I heard you talking about that earlier, but then it was like, I thought... <laughs> You're, so all your imperial stouts are in that vein. I mean, that's where you, if you're if if it's an imperial stout from Morgantown, it's going to be a little bit wacky, maybe. I, I think different. so. We we've come to find that if someone's buying an eleven percent dark beer, they're generally not looking for anything that's quote unquote normal. They they want something that's a little bit. You want a story to tell to your friends when you go home. So. Right. Um, yeah, with that one, we just threw hundreds and hundreds of ding-dongs right in the mash tun and, and dissolved them with the rest of the sugar. And then we added, after that, um, it was, I don't even remember, it was, it was almost 100 pounds of marshmallows that we dissolved it into the kettle. Wow. Yeah, well, it, but it all fermented out. So it left behind just the, the marshmallow flavor without the sugar, which is great. So, yeah, it's brutal, but... <laughs> Sounds it's it's really always a sweet. fun brew day because it's, you know, double yeah. the grain, everything's chocolate flavored and the beer looks like motor oil, but. I imagine it smells fantastic there. Yes. When I, when I came in, uh, or I guess I was there first thing in the morning, but when the servers started to arrive and the guys that worked in the kitchen, they walked in like, what's that smell? I'm like, does it, does it smell like ding dongs to you? <laughs> but none of them could quite put their finger on that smell. Well, I like that you're carrying on the heritage of the brewery, the brew pub in Morgantown, you know, <laughs> this is like, you're, yeah. you're, and you're taking it in some new directions, which are, uh, are fun. And, and I have to admit, I mean, I probably wouldn't be my first thought of drinking a ding dong beer, but hey, <laughs> I, I can't say that it, it, it doesn't have a market. And I think that's, a, that's, that's good stuff for our brewing industry in West Virginia to see people doing that. You guys, I mean, you know, we started, what, with One Onion, we went to West Virginia Brewing, then we go to Morgantown Brewing with uh, Art Gallagher's version, and uh, uh, you guys took over a couple years ago and are, are really recreating, I guess, uh, the whole beer scene there at Morgantown Brewing, and, and it's, it's good to see, you guys. It's exciting, yeah. Yeah, we're at least trying to breathe new life into it. But. We wish you the best of luck in all your endeavors going forward. 
I'm awesome. I, I really appreciate it. This was, this was great. This was a lot of fun. Good. Yeah, we'll have to do it again. I'd love to catch up with you, you know, every six months or so, something like that, and, and make sure that we uh, keep West Virginia beer fans up to date with what's going on in Morgantown, because especially now that you don't distribute, you got to go to Morgantown, folks, to get this beer. I mean, it's you, you can't get it in Charleston, can't get it in Huntington. Uh, got to yeah, get it in. Soon. Yeah, but hopefully soon. And when we come back, and once that's here, maybe that's a good reason for us to visit with you guys again, maybe get Chris on too and, um, and, and talk to you guys about it. So thanks a lot for coming on today. That's Cody Cheesebro from Morgantown Brewing Company, Morgantown, West Virginia. Again, we got the Heritage as West Virginia's oldest brewery, small brewery or brew pub uh, from about what, 1992, right? When it mm -hmm. founded, I think, yeah, there you go. Thank you so much, Cody. We appreciate your time today. Awesome. Thank you to both of you. All right, cheers. It. For West Virginia Roots. This brings us to the close of another podcast. Remember, you can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast host. Thank you for listening to West Virginia Beer Roads. West Virginia Beer Roads is a production of BrilliantStream.com.